Lord, as we enter into this time of prayer, I thank you for this group. I thank you for their souls that will live forever. And Lord, we pray in your blessed presence before your face in heaven. Lord, help me as I teach and as we pray. Lord, may this uh, evening time of worship be a blessing to our souls and then ultimately to you. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. We are in Romans chapter 5 for the evening study. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 is where we pick up, particularly looking at verses 12 through 21. So if I were to use the phrase, the first man, who would you think of? If I was to use the phrase, the first man, you'd think of Adam, right? He's the first man of all humanity, the firstborn, uh, not really born, but the first one ever created. Dad, you can... Okay, so we established the first man, you think of Adam. Now, if I was to use the term, the last man, what do you think of? Or who do you think of? The last man. Well, naturally, you would think that's the last man who'd ever be born before, say, the end of the world. So if Adam's the first man, the first one ever made, no humans before him, he's the first man. But the Bible actually says that there is a last man. And it's not referring to the last person ever to be born before the end of the world, but the last man in the Bible is Jesus. Jesus is called the second man. And it's also a little bit confusing because Jesus is also called the firstborn. So Jesus is both the second man and the firstborn. And so scripture teaches that history actually ends and begins in Christ. History ends and begins in Christ. He's the second man, the last man, and he's the firstborn of the new creation. So very, very interesting stuff here. When we get into Romans chapter 5, look at verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Adam hiding from the Lord in the garden. Remember when we find that in Genesis chapter 3? When Adam and Eve are hiding from the Lord because they had fallen, they had sinned, and so they run from his presence, they hear his footsteps as, as the Lord walks with them in the cold of the day, and rather than running to him to have fellowship, they hide from him among the trees. When Adam and Eve hide from the Lord in the garden, you know what that, that screams? Here is a man who does not have peace with God. Here is a man, here is a woman who does not have peace with God. And at the very beginning of this chapter, in Romans chapter 5, as the Apostle Paul is going to write about Adam and Christ, the first man and the last man, comparing them, he starts off by saying, we have peace with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly what Adam and Eve did not have, or any of their children, because of sin, sin that separates us from God. Now, go down to verse 12. Verse 12, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, 
So one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as why by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, many, many big ideas there. A couple words repeated a lot, like obedience, disobedience, righteousness, life, and death. But what Paul is explaining here is the relationship between Adam and Jesus Christ, the first man and the last man. And essentially what he lays down here, as, as he lays out the salvation and the history of the world, is that the history of salvation is traced from Adam to the law, and then from the law to Jesus Christ. And the first truth laid down here is that death entered the experience of all people as a universal reality through just one person. Death entered the world through just one person, and that's Adam, the first man. Now, the interesting thing here in Romans chapter 5 is that Paul says essentially that just as what the fall was like, so also will be God's rescue of the world. Just as the fall was like this, so also the rescue is going to be similar and in, in line with it. What is he talking about here? Just as sin and death entered the world through one man, Adam, Paul's point here is that the opportunity for eternal life, forgiveness, and living a righteous life before God, all of that entered into the world also through one man, but it's Jesus. Now, a lot of people, even Christians, get really nervous and they buck up against the idea of what's just commonly called original sin. They don't like that idea because they say, it's not fair that Adam sinned and then all of his posterity died. It's not fair that just one man sinned representing the human race and then through him, I now struggle with temptation, sin, the flesh, and the devil. Because they, people will say, that's not fair. There have been even preachers like Charles Finney and others who, who basically say that man is actually born upright and, and, and you're not a sinner until you actually sin. Now, that's not what the Bible teaches, though. Secular philosophy wants people to be blank slates. Everyone's just born a blank slate. And it's only through outside forces, outside influences, that you become the person that you are, whether good or bad. And so they read Romans 5, which clearly says that through one man, death and sin entered the world. And that even over those who lived between Adam and the law, even they died, even though there was no law given. Well, why did they die? It's because the sin nature was transferred from Adam to all of his children. And so they want to reject this here in Romans 5. They want to reject the idea of original sin because they have this idea that it is not just, that it's not right. But if you reject that part, which I, I believe Romans 5 teaches, original sin, the um, inheritance of, of a sin nature and of a fall from our first parents, Adam and Eve, if you reject that, then how are you going to re receive the part about Jesus Christ, which teaches us that through him, we are made righteous, which teaches that because of the obedience and because of the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, that can count for you and be given to you as a free gift. You see what Paul is saying here. Just as Adam disobeyed in the garden, was exiled from the garden, and all of his children after him were sinners outside of God's grace until they, re they, they repented and believed. Paul is saying in the same way, Jesus Christ is the exact opposite of Adam, and yet the free gift comes to us because Christ represented us on the tree. Christ represented as the head of the new humanity so that everybody who looks to him in faith receive as a free gift his righteousness, his life, and his forgiveness. And so at the center of history is not Adam who fell, but Christ who rose. The heartbeat of this world, the pattern and the theme of this world is not the wreckage brought about by the first father, bad as it is, but the heartbeat and the pattern and the gospel 
is that the grace which was poured out on humanity in abundance through Jesus Christ, that's what this thing is about. That's what the gospel is about. That's the hope and the enduring confidence we have in God. I believe based on Romans chapter 5 that I believe that Christ will not be satisfied and will not return until the grace that he pours out by his cross and through the Holy Spirit actually exceeds the death and the sin caused by Adam. Why do I believe that? Did you count how many times or notice how many times in Romans chapter 5 Paul mentions the sin and death that came through Adam but then he follows that up by saying, but much more is the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. He says it multiple times. In fact, Romans chapter 5 is, is like the much more chapter. As, as Paul talks about the struggle we have with sin, as Paul talks about the wreckage of the fall with our first parents, again and again he says much more then, more abundantly then. And what is he talking about? The grace and the peace and the righteousness that you can have as a Christian. The fall of Adam will not have the final say. Adam's di disobedience will not be more effective in causing pain than will Christ's obedience and righteousness be effective in renovating and healing the world. So then, I, I lay that before you, what is your theology? Who is more influential in the world, Adam or Christ? What's of more weight and effect, sin or righteousness? Who has the final word, Adam who fell at the tree or Christ who obeyed on a tree? One Christian writes this, that the, rep the repetition of all the more and more abundantly we find in Paul's letter here with regard to Christ stresses that the gift received in him far surpasses Adam's sin and its consequences on humanity. I'll read verse 20 once again. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So one, one practical application here as we close out on Romans chapter 5 is, sadly, I feel the old Adam in me all too often. The old sin nature, whether anger, foolish thinking, idleness, whatever it might be, you may also. But what we glean in hope from Romans chapter 5 is fear not, rejoice. The second Adam the last man, the new and better head of humanity, Jesus Christ. He has done something for you at another tree, the cross, that will keep you, withstand you, despite you, and one day will present, will present you innocent, justified, and loved before the face of God. Because unlike Adam who blamed his wife, and did not guard his wife from the serpent. Christ guards his bride, the church, protects his bride, and will remain faithful to her until the final day when he presents us before the Father. This is also what Paul writes about the relationship between Adam and Christ in 1 Corinthians 15. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. That's the idea here, is that humanity is summed up in two men. First man, Adam, who fell, and all who remain in Adam by natural birth share in his fallenness and sin. But the second man, the last man, Jesus Christ, is the representative of all who trust in him. And so which chair are you sitting in? Adam's chair or Christ, or Christ's chair? Adam's fallen world with a fallen nature by natural birth 
or Christ, the Redeemer and the Renewer of all the nations, who gives the second birth. And so Jesus says, you must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. That's the big idea here, is that Adam's disobedience may have brought condemnation upon all, but Christ's obedience, perfect obedience, surely brings justification and forgiveness to all who look to him in faith. And so let us take that, remember the simplicity of that, and help us understand not only the Bible, but history as God unfolds it. So, any thoughts or questions at this point, or...